done one for a while. Um, I have a brilliant, brilliant guest coming on, Dinesh Patel. Can't wait to see him and uh, chat through. Ah, uh, oh, oh, they know, they know. By the way, whilst I'm sitting here waiting for Dinesh to arrive, I am going to have a little glass of this. Um, it's um, whatever time it is in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon. Hi, everybody. And um, I am having, this is that wonderful Blanc de Blanc, uh, which is a Frais Jean Frais Blanc de Blanc. Here's, here we go. Yes, go live with Dinesh. Uh, Dinesh, there we go. Where are you? In a minute, waiting for Dinesh to come on. And there you are. Dinesh, how I, are you? I'm good, thank you, Robert. How are you? Really well, good. Well, I'm going to say cheers. I'm, I'm sort of sitting cheers. here at this end. Well done, <laughs> well done. Mm. Well, we have just been, or my wife has just been looking at your Instagram page and say, gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> Why, where's the shop? So are you based in, are you based in Bolton? So currently I'm based in Bolton. Um, I also used to live in Kensington in London. So right. um, all over the place really, but my family's all here in Bolton and I grew up in Bolton in the Northwest. So I'm here at the moment and I'm basing myself from here at the moment as well. And so I'm asking all the questions that my wife just suddenly went through and said, oh my God, it's absolutely fantastic. We'll come to how you got there and how you, and why you're doing such wonderful baking in a minute. But um, do you have a shop? At the moment, it's not a commercial outlet. We take right. bespoke orders. So the way I've always worked with any of my cakes, bakes or treats or confections is that I like to evoke memories. Um, so I like to speak to people what they love to eat, what their tastes are. Maybe there's a memory that evokes a particular flavor on their palate. I like to take all of that information and create bespoke um, cakes and bakes for them. So it's yeah. never been a walk-in situation. It's more kind of whatever you fantasize about when it comes to sweets, we will make for you and hopefully make it a memorable oh, occasion. Gosh, amazing. Well, look, it's a great journey that you've been on to get where you are and we spoke um before and it was are you i mean speaking to you is fascinating anyway because it's a great story but i think for everyone out there looking um uh you should basically give us a bit of a uh, how you got there where you where you started and i know you know you've been in law and you've been on Mars <laughs> Jeff and you've been a whole raft of different routes but so so where did the the well, I won't even say the love of baking because that obviously came, but where, where did the love of cooking come from? Um, I sort of started at the beginning. It's quite a long story, as you've <laughs> mentioned, um, some in a, a very long journey. Um, I started kind of baking when I was very young. Um, just the basic things, you know, your kind of standard four, four, four ounces, two eggs kind of cakes that you make at home. <laughs> hey, listen, um, I've just made today in honor of you, my flapjacks, <laughs> my so banana sweet. flapjacks. Lovely, Donna, lovely. Pass, pass my, I'm going to show you. I don't do baking, by the way. Look at my banana flapjacks. Very nice, very, very nice, very, nice. very, very nice. <laughs> uh, my, my, my assistant here, my wife, is very nice. Um, <laughs> and I don't do a lot of baking, but I thought I'm going to do something for you today. You mentioned that obviously um, baking is quite technical, right? We always kind of have to measure all the ingredients. And I think um, the way that I kind of bake because of the Eastern influence that comes into my baking as well, some of the things tend to be a bit more or less measured. It's kind of, you have to watch it, smell it, feel the textures, things like that. It's not about um, measuring everything so precisely, especially when you go into the realms of Eastern baking and Eastern desserts and things like like that. Um, as you were saying just about my journey, um, that kind of Eastern influence has come kind of later in my life, I would say. I started off baking very simply. Um, and those are kind of memories back when I was a kid are what have kind of pushed me towards the patisserie section um, more than anything else. Um, I studied law at university. Um, I, do, I did enjoy my academics and things like that, but underlying, I've always had this baking business and um, right. working with food and all of that going alongside. So after I finished my degree, it only seemed natural for me to kind of progress into that and sort of give it a shot, you know, it, what could well, go you know, wrong? Well, 
when you say after I finish my law degree, it only seems natural to become a baker. <laughs> it sort of doesn't quite, but I know what you're saying because yeah, it was already yeah, yeah. there and you did your law degree. Um, but, um, and the other thing I just, whilst you, whilst you talk, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of things because, um, yeah, baking is very precise uh, often yeah. or most of the time. The other thing about baking, which is why for me, it never really ticked my box. Although I really enjoy it, you know, flapjacks are quick, you know, but it takes a long time. I noticed on your, um, when I was looking through your Instagram, you did some hot cross buns. Yeah. Now, hot cross buns are not quick to make, are they? No, traditionally they're not. No, five hours later, I'm still prepared. (laughs) I'm still finishing. And I thought, and I said, you know, I started in the afternoon. I do some, I did Mary Berry's hot cross buns. And I thought I'll start this uh, because I do like a bit of baking and I'm actually quite good at it. It's just I find it because it's all when I cook as a chef, yeah, I just do something and it can be uh, <laughs> like I just did a chicken chasseur. You know, it doesn't matter how much to, I put enough tomato in. I put enough tarragon in. I put a bit this, a bit of that. And actually, one of the issues, um, Dinesh, is that everyone says to me, how much do you use? I said, I don't know. Yeah. I just do yeah. it. But of course, baking is precise. So. Sorry, I interrupted. So going from your natural progression from a lawyer into a baker. <laughs> it seems a very odd combination. I completely agree when I say it. It sounds odd, but um, it, there's kind of two sides to my personality. I have this kind of side which is incredibly creative and I like to cook and bake. Somebody said lots of love from Pakistan. I don't know where you can see these lovely messages that are coming oh, out. Oh, lovely, gorgeous. lovely. Yeah. Pakistan's very close to my heart, so lots of love to them too. Um, so as I was just saying, there's kind of two sides to my personality. On one side, you've got this creative, you know, that wants to create these bakes and, um, and use ingredients and be different and innovative and all of that. And on the other side, you've got something which is quite technical and quite studious and um, quite in tune with current affairs, that kind of thing. So doing the law degree kind of was a natural progression to that side of my personality. Right. And coming from a South Asian background, initially when you kind of say, you you can't go to your parents for a want want of a way of putting it and say that, oh, I I want to be a chef. It it doesn't necessarily sit very well um, in the first instance. Um, Something I wish I could change in the mentality of the South Asian world as well. But fulfilling that element of kind of doing the studious elements of life was really important to me and something that I enjoyed as well. Once I'd done all of that, I kind of had free reign um, to explore the other elements of my passions to do with food and baking. And it's a passion that developed, I think, like I said, from a very young age. And it's something that has always been with me. Um, I think for me, de-stressing before a law exam was making a traditional um, kheer or rice, Indian rice pudding over the stove, just simmering away, looking at my revision notes. So having that and that together, both elements of my personality together underlying, mm. um, I just wanted to go whole hog after I finished that degree and I just wanted to completely immerse myself in that world. So it's, to me, it seemed completely natural. So uh, one of the, one of the um, really interesting um, parts of our discussion last time was of course the, the Indian influence into desserts, which for me yeah. is very limited. Um, I can only think of the desserts that I've had, uh, if we call them Indian, South Asian, well, you know, we'll, we'll use that as, a, as just a term at the moment. But whenever I've been to Bangladeshi weddings or Indian weddings or uh, other weddings from different cultures and different, you know, whether it's a Hindu wedding or a Muslim wedding or whatever, the dessert is super sweet, really sweet yeah. and quite creamy and a bit yeah. ricey. So, but they all seem to be now. This is me being no knowledge at all in Indian desserts, and here is you. Um, and another thing I'm going to pick up in a minute, actually, which is really interesting point, was about how when you go to your parents, you want to say, "I want to be a chef." How? But we'll come back to that. Don't let me for, don't let me leave that because that's a really interesting <laughs> yes. point because that comes across in my young chef, young waiter program right now. But um, 
I want to dig, dig deeper into the world of Indian desserts because that is about as much as I've got. You know, <laughs> that super sweet, the milky, creamy, the ricey, like, like rice pudding type of thing. Completely. Fare. I understand the perspective that you're coming from. And I think that, um, obviously, I've had, you mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity to go to India when I took part in MasterChef India season, season five. So right. prior to that, being um, a British individual living in this country, being born in this country, brought up here, the Indian sweets and desserts that I'd actually tried were probably very similar to the ones that you may have sampled. Okay. Um, there's a couple of others that change, um, you know, w within kind of communities that are a lot more traditional and not more out, and uh, not really out there. Um, but the ones that you may have tried at weddings or things are kind of the, the staple few that every kind of restaurant or catering service really just tries to go to and just sticks on the bottom of the menu. When I went back to India, I realized and I saw and learned that Indian desserts are so, so complex. Right, um, you've got right. a myriad of different ingredients that are used over there, a myriad of different flavors that do completely differ from this sickly sweet kind of milk filled impression that we have here in the UK yeah, of yeah. Indian desserts. Um, Wonderfully, you have restaurants now as well, like Dishoom, Jamava in London, um, chefs like Atul Kocha out mm. there, really pushing the boundaries with some of these desserts as well now. But I want to kind of take that to a next level. So for me, I, when I went back to India, I learned the basic ways of making these traditional recipes, heritage recipes that are being lost because people aren't carrying them on or they're not popularized. And to understand the complexities of that, the flavor profiles, and then bring that into kind of Western technique and into the 21st century is what I think is really important. Hopefully changing this perspective that it's been given of sickly sweet, rice filled, milk filled desserts that you kind yeah. of after a heavy Indian meal don't have an inclination no it's all. the last thing sort of I mean you can think of I'm trying to think I mean you know mango is always something yeah. but I'm really I'm really you know picking on on very simple bits here and, and as I said my knowledge you know my knowledge in in the in the within the starter uh, here we go, my Indian heritage desserts are just so different. I love that you're doing this. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. Well, I'm loving it as well because I'm learning, you know, with, with, with Dinesh that we're learning about, about it. And when you think of the produce of India or Bangladesh or, or Sri Lanka or all of those South Asian countries, I mean, you have everything. You have color, you have spice, you have Absolutely. sweet, you have everything and so but it is at the moment when you go and have a traditional whether it's a curry in bolton or a curry in knightsbridge or Athol's <laughs> or your or wherever the last thing you're going to think about is what i'm going to have for dessert Absolutely. whereas when i go to a, a let's say a classic restaurant you know i personally uh i really enjoy the puddings or the desserts i really do i've always had a that sort of inkling. And certainly as I get older, for some reason, I'm jumping on it more. Hence, I can't wait to have one of my <laughs> flapjacks a bit later. But so there must be so many opportunities for you. Now, it's not an easy one, but once you get it going, there has to be so many opportunities within a, a, a South Asian restaurant format or boxes or whatever, whatever it is. And, and you know, the, the South Asian community, I would imagine, would sort of love this because you would just take them back. To... Absolutely. I think um, when you're saying about memories there, as I said in the very beginning, um, evoking those memories of childhood comfort, things like that with food is really important to me. So when I'm revisiting these heritage recipes, I'm talking about recipes that you'd find in remote villages from particular sectors of India and particular corners of India that are really completely unheard of and not even likely to be found in a South Asian delicatessen anywhere in the UK. And 
because they're so complicated, because they're so specialized, and because it's those people, specifically probably in that small, tiny shops in some corner in India that make that dessert, you're not going to get it ever again no. in this country unless you find somebody like like myself that's willing to kind of bring that into a popularized light um it's true what you say i think at the end of the meal um there's always room for desserts isn't there and i think um just that statement alone is what kind of it makes me happy just thinking about it because sweets are that at the end of the meal and you smile and you eat it and you remember it as well as that last oh. course well, it always has to be, doesn't it? I was always taught that if you're giving somebody a coffee, make sure it's the best coffee because Absolutely. that is the last thing you're going to take away from that restaurant. Yes. That absolutely. you're going to eat. You know, you want a great service, everything else. But the last thing you're going to eat or drink is probably a coffee or a tea or whatever it may be. Um, so tell me, give me a, for instance, give me something that is, that, that let's just say I've now... I'm a, I'm, I love a dessert. So now let's just say I've had my, I've been at Atoll Cotchers, uh, <laughs> who has been on this show, been on my restaurant live with Sarah's Toddy Waller and Atoll and Sanjay. And, um, and um, what would I have? Give me a classic dessert that I've never even thought of having. So I'll go for my classic favorite, which is actually a dessert called Shrikhand. Um, it comes from the states of Maharashtra and Gujarat in India, these particular two states. And it's essentially just hung curd, but it's be you beat that with lots of sugar and lots of nuts and lots of different spices. So you've got specifically um, pandanus leaf extracts with gera water. You've got saffron and you've got cardamom, these three kind of major holy trinity when it comes to Indian desserts. You beat that over a gradual period of time, introducing air continuously. And that really thick, tight, hung curd, the level of acidity with the sugar and the spice balances perfectly to give you something that's light, airy, palate cleansing, but equally satisfying for that kind of sweet tooth. So for me, at the end of an Indian meal, that's usually very rich, full of heady chili, spices, coriander, all of that. You've got this clean yogurt that leaves a very nice citrusy note at the very end. So for me, that's, that's my perfect classic kind of Indian dessert there. That's what I'd recommend. That's what I'd probably make for yourself anyway. And you know, and I'm sure everyone else, you know, listening to you, listening to the way you describe the desserts, listening to your passion for the desserts, it would make, um, I'm thinking somebody there, I'm thinking of driving up to Bolton. <laughs> They're most welcome. <laughs> um, and it just makes you think that you can see, uh, you could see you in a restaurant or in an environment or on TV or somewhere explaining this to a, an audience, wherever that audience is, whether it's in a <laughs> restaurant. Or, because, That's a massive compliment. Thank you so but, much. You know, because the knowledge you have is the knowledge which is quite, it's quite rare because it's such a unique quality, I think. Well, I think, because <laughs> I'm listening to you. Now, you know, I imagine the big chefs, the atolls and and, the, and, you know, the amazing uh, Indian and, and South Asian chefs we have in this country will know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and somebody here, that Dinesh, what an amazing inspiration. Oh, how lovely that is. Oh, thank you. Thank you so and, much. And, um, but it really feels that, that there's, that, you know, you've, you've got something that is so unique and so different and your knowledge is so incredible that, to challenge you. I always think, you know, if you're going to create something different, you need to be the one who can lead them from the front. But there has to be some really interesting opportunities. I don't know why they are at the moment, you know, and I don't know. How, but certainly I, I love listening to you and your knowledge. So just go back quickly when you were in India, you, you did MasterChef. Yeah. Now that would have been, you wouldn't have just done desserts, of course, you would have done other dishes. No, so um, my first dish that I made in the MasterChef India kitchen was a dessert. Um, to be honest, that entire experience really pushed the boundaries for me because 
yes, I'm Indian in heritage, but I've been brought up in the UK. So my awareness of Indian food and Indian kind of technique and spices and even the equipment that's used is very limited to growing up in kind of the South Asian. I have a, I have a little dog here, by the way. He's just oh, going to so go. Sweet. I think he's going to say hello to somebody. <laughs> okay, he's just going to go. <laughs> he was sitting next to me. It's oh, time sweet. to get up. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So I was just saying that for me, kind of growing up in the South Asian diaspora in England, it's quite limiting to know the actual techniques, spices, equipment that I actually needed to use in, in India. So for me, right. that really pushed my boundaries. Sure, yeah. So my first dish was a dessert in the MasterChef India kitchen. But on that very round, um, Chef Vikas Khanna from um, New York, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, he was one of the lead judges and he said to me, you've made one dessert, now that's it. So I, all of a sudden I was taken aback because I'm used to making sweets. Um, so I had to go back to kind of my days of, I used to do it in half chefing as well when I was in university. Um, so I used to make a lot of different Indian dishes, fusion dishes, taking my experience from kind of the London restaurant scene as well, what I picked up, seen, eaten, tasted, and create fusion dishes that were not only sweet, but savoury. And I loved doing it, that concept of MasterChef. Um, you can't really find it anywhere else. When you get that mystery box and you have these ingredients and you just have to on the spot come up with something. It's so challenging, but it's so mm. gratifying equally. Well, if you get good comments, it's pretty gratifying. If you get yeah, a couple yeah, of yeah, negative yeah. ones, it's not not yeah. so gratifying. But the, the sheer challenge of it all, um, and especially with the savory side of things to push my boundaries there, mm. gave me an understanding of the complexities of how to work with spice and Indian technique and fuse it with kind of Western technique as well and flavor. Um, so that helped me greatly in my helps me greatly now with my menus because I'm looking at a westernized palette with kind of that Asian mentality and that quick thinking comes back to me even now. Right, right. Somebody's saying, how are you? Uh, a big <laughs> fan here. Um, so sweet. Fred, so um, you need to read all these names. They might be That's names that you recognize. Yeah. It? So that well, <laughs> hi there. Uh, and uh, great. So so you, but you, you know, going back to, um, going back to just cooking classic cuisine, not in desserts at the moment, then you would have been brought up obviously within that, within, within world of, of, you know, uh, South Asian cuisine. Uh, and so your knowledge would have still been, been there, but at what age do you think you would said about prior to university, but what age do you think? Well, I mean, where did the, bit about desserts come in i mean it's, it's not sort of you know it's quite it's i'm, I'm I, I find I, I find you fascinating because <laughs> because you know where do you where does it start that you think i am going to concentrate on eastern desserts on on you know my my culture my 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 homeland but i'm going to concentrate on the desserts mainly where you would think the easy route i've got my guy back the easy route is to really do the um is to do you know like ash or like others i'm sure you would be brilliant at those as well i think it comes from there's a couple of different parameters with this particular question because for me initially i'm attracted to sweets because i feel like when there's a special occasion if there's a happy moment um culturally and in general as well i think we all turn to something that's a sweet if you take something as simple as a birthday cake you're celebrating somebody's birthday with something that's a special treat which is that cake so yeah, sweets yeah. and happiness are synonymous with one another so if i've been tasked with making somebody's birthday cake or giving somebody something sweet i'm inevit inevitably giving them some form of happiness and that makes lovely. me happy i like that <laughs> i like that it's a lovely way of thinking about cooking absolutely because it, you're right isn't it i mean you know and if donna comes in and she's had a a bit of a stress day, the first thing she goes, you're going to have a piece of chocolate. Cheers Absolutely. Cheers chocolate up. fixes everything. <laughs> chocolate yeah. fixes them. And, but you also make, um, you're the toughest contestant out there. So obviously somebody watched you at MasterChef, I would imagine. <laughs> um, the, um, you make wedding cakes as well, don't you? 
Yes. So um, prior to COVID, unfortunately, um, I did do a lot of high-end weddings. Um, what kind of drew, drew me to that world was the elements of kind of sugar craft, chocolate work, things like yeah, that. Yeah, beautiful. Um, my inspiration for a lot of the details and work that I do comes from literature and fashion mainly. Um, the last collection that I designed was inspired by things like Swan Lakes, ballet, um, you know, elements of nature, bringing that into kind of fashion, detail, things like that. Um, I took some inspiration from Sarah Burtonwood at Alexander McQueen when designing one of my cakes. Wow. So combining, I have a great love of fashion. And when you say the last collection, the last collection <laughs> of cakes? Yes, exactly. So I used to every kind of periodically um, have these cakes stuck in my head, images of things that I, I'd seen wow. or things that I wanted to bring Amazing. together into sugar craft and chocolate work and yeah. I designed them um, and then use kind of the dummy cakes, you know, the polystyrene um, dummy yeah, 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 and yeah. craft them completely with sugar craft and chocolate work. And, and you're talking, when you, when you talk of sugar craft, you're talking of pulling sugar and creating that sugar craft? So more to do with kind of modeling paste. So you've got yeah. fondant, you've got gum paste, you've got yeah. ice malt sugar there. You've got a little bit of sugar work with the pulling sugar um, and you've got elements of chocolate work as well. Um, now I think styles of wedding cakes have come more towards um, more towards patisserie style kind of rough, ready kind of designs. Mm -hmm. But initially, when I kind of stepped into these world, you ha this world, you had massive ornate wedding cakes that were sheer showstoppers. So for me, that enthralled me completely because you've got li little old me who's in love with different elements of fashion design and all of this and you're bringing that into another passion which is food so the combination of the two bringing those design details to life in those kind of collections um was amazing for me i really enjoyed it it was getting the designs out of my head essentially it's fantastic and and were these wedding cakes for everybody or were these wedding cakes specifically for like big lavish yeah, Indian weddings or I think with the price point um they're, they're for <laughs> quite lavish. The lavish weddings you know um yeah. we used ingredients um you know a lot of gold leaf gilding in there the kind of flavors that we did were the best saffron in the world we'd get the wow. best pistachios we'd get lemons from Sicily you know we'd be getting the maple syrup from Canada things like that are wow. what we created not just from the outside from the inside as well so when you're kind of getting the best of the best for that special moment for that person, um, obviously it's, it's for somebody that's willing to kind of put their all into that event and that special day, really. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't say it was for everybody, but at, at those moments for said individuals that wanted to invest that into their day. And so go sort of up to sort of now. So your, your current job, if you like, is to... Is to work from your from your kitchen yeah uh and from your base in bolton and do you send dishes out do you send cakes out do you send other pastry so, products out to different locations are you sort of online absolutely so what we've in kind of reaction to covid um you know i saw all of these events kind of go away there was no more wedding or there was no nothing mm. going on really so i started to wonder how best to re-engage with my audience and kind of back to that original ethos that I'm talking about of share, sharing a little bit of happiness um, in even such dire straits and times. So what I've gone to now is a concept which I've called by Dinesh essentially and there are a myriad of different bakes both bespoke and an ever-changing menu of cakes, desserts, bars, biscuits that can be popped into a hamper and sent to anywhere in the UK nationally. And you can share those moments with friends, with others, with even somebody down the road, anybody that you possibly want to. And they can Brilliant. evoke memories, they can comfort you, you can be happy eating it. So for me, that's what I currently do. Um, and to be honest, in comparison to kind of the wedding cakes and things that I did in that wedding industry, Yes, I do love it, and I probably will go back to it at some point. But there's something so lovely about having this mass audience right now of mm. people in such a 
constraint that we've gone through and being able to share that happiness with even more people at a price point that's so much more accessible. So those little bespoke elements are just going that little bit further for me. Um, And it's really gratifying and I'm really enjoying it, to be honest. I think um, a bit like you, you know, through, I I run events, you know, so um, there were no events. So uh, I started cooking again (laughs) and and I absolutely loved it. And I didn't realize how much I missed cooking. You know, I do lots of things. I put Michelin and, and, all, and, and the Young Chef, Young Waiter program, which I'll come back to in a minute, and, and big gala dinners, and the, which I host and run. Well, we couldn't do any of that. So I thought, well, I'll start cooking and I'll do it online. And I'll show the people out there that have no idea what I do other than, you know, stand up in front of the, an audience at the Savoy or something in front of three or 400 people say, yeah, my name's Rob William when I do this. And, and it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic to get to see the produce, the way produce, you know, I stopped, I say I stopped cooking for money in 2002 because I, I was then, I had a big venue, we did massive events, and so I needed to run the events, and so I'd stop chefing then, really. But what I have noticed is, um, so the, 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 the amount of ingredients, of course, which, which we're all uh, uh, aware of, you can go to any supermarket, you see loads of ingredients, but more so, what's in my local shop, what's fresh in my local shop, uh, in my local farm shop up the road here. Yeah. And so I just get my carrots from the local shop. I get my onions and I love buying onions and I love buying fresh, you know, parsnips. I mean, it's bananas that I have fallen in love with (laughs) buying produce and cooking fresh food. I have never felt better in all my life. I have never felt better. I sleep well. I eat three meals a day. I I mean, it is ridiculous. My whole life has changed. So I think you mentioned as well in one of your other lives that I had um, I'd seen about you'd made a roast chicken and then the very next day you'd made a stock with it and you made a lovely soup with that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been a great, great kind of ethos to have in this lockdown. Um, and it's exactly how I've been as well. I mean, mm. Prior to this, I probably didn't have the time to cook every single day. But with being in a lockdown situation, I was equally cooking every day and I had to come up with something new. But this kind of upcycling and recycling of produce and creating these dishes that were almost with, for some recipes, they're regarded as peasant dishes from simple ingredients, fresh produce, locally sourced, that has mm. such an integrity. And for me, kind of bumping it up with a couple of spices yeah, um, was yeah. really, it, it was fun. You know, it, it got me through lockdown equally completely. And you don't feel guilty about eating that food because you know it's so clean. And well, you're it's, happy with it. it's just a bowl of COVID proof food. You Absolutely. know, I mean, it just, builds up it's full of nutrition it builds up your yeah. immune system and and it costs six pounds for eight portions of chicken soup because exactly. you're using the chicken of the day before you know yeah. and when you hear about you know and you think about the cost of food there are so many ways that you can use food you know economically but nutritionally And so, so I can feel myself suddenly getting on my soapbox here, you know, telling (laughs) people, but, but, you know, then we come back to today and I have made flapjacks today on a Thursday. Well, that was, that never happened. I haven't got time to do flapjacks (laughs) on a Thursday. Do you know what I mean? And so, but I have now and my world will change. My life will change. I will continue cooking and posting that and and like you when you the the social media route which is brand new to me <laughs> has been really enjoyable i've really yeah. really enjoyed it and thankfully everyone's been very kind um nobody's been too nasty to me um but you know i'm just cooking i'm not out there i'm <laughs> trying not to do anything political or anything that's going to upset anybody it's difficult sometimes like you said it's um prior to this kind of lockdown 
um, I was a bit less engaged with social media for being kind of a millennial, so for putting it that way. I'm not very techie, completely techie in that way. So for me, um, in lockdown, kind of creating recipes that were very store cupboard, sharing them, getting people to engage, you know, having people try those recipes and finding their love for food and equally finding my own love for food again um, right. was really, really gratifying completely. Somebody just asked, what's this discussion about? Well, I will tell you what it's about. It's about actually, it's ultimately, it's about Indian puddings, Indian desserts or South Asian desserts. That's what it's all about, really. <laughs> and I suppose really, it's probably a good time to get back onto that subject. Perhaps. So... <laughs> Um, so what is the plan now then? What is the plan um, for you going forward? Uh, you know, what's the vision for Dinesh? So currently, I think one of the things that I'm really enjoying doing is writing um, my first ever book. Um, so it kind of has this, it's all to do with kind of a British Asian kitchen. Um, and it's about the recipes that as a diaspora we've created um, from a combination of British culture and Indian culture that we brought with us and recipes that you'll find in a lot of South Asian households within the UK that aren't necessarily kind of traditional they're just something that we've come up with and that's going down both the savory route and the sweet route you've got um, fusion desserts from myself in there as well from my travels what I've discovered the ingredients of this nation which is amazing as well using a couple of those and adding a couple of those eastern flavors in as well and I'm also looking looking at the um, Anglo-Asian community, which is in India. So there's a particular diaspora of um, individuals that have Anglo-Saxon heritage, but that settled in India and a lot of their food, which is amazing. Um, a friend of mine who was actually in MasterChef with me comes from that background and I had the pleasure to kind of visit her a lot and her family a lot. Um, so seeing a lot of the similarities of the way that they cook with British culture having been brought up here was really interesting because they were making things that we kind of make here but with an Indian twist um, mm. so a lot of the recipes I've developed kind of have a nod to that diaspora as well so that's what the book comprises of mainly and just that journey for me. Wow um, it's amazing are there lots <laughs> of fruits in Indian desserts are there lots of fruit? There is um, a lot of fruit in a lot of different ways, but it focuses on seasonality, which is something I, I greatly adore. I mean, at the moment, you've got Alfonso mangoes that have just come into season and the different mango varieties that we're getting now from India being imported. Um, so in India, it's equally the same. If there's a classic dessert in any kind of region, it may only be available for those few months because of the, the seasonality of a fruit. So all of those fruits that you do see in Indian desserts, if, if at all you see them, they are very seasonally based, mainly centering around the mango, to be very honest, as a, yeah, yeah, as a country, yeah, yeah. it's a national fruit. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I love mango, but there, I mean, there are a million things you can do with mango, and Absolutely. I'm sure that they do that in there. And... Um, but it, it is, as you say, it's fascinating. So the goal is to to in, to carry on what you're doing, Absolutely, to write yeah. a book, and then is it yeah. to get a a, a location? Or, I mean, are you thinking of coming back to London one day, or are you going to open a shop or a restaurant or a? I think for me, it's not necessarily about having a commercial outlet. I think for me, it's um, with, I will always stick to kind of the e-commerce route of, thi of things yeah. um, because this bespoke element, having these ever-changing menus, kind of being somewhat of a kind of Willy Wonka, continually changing things with my flavors is really, really important to me. And having a commercial setup, I think maybe taking away from that element and I, right, I don't want to right. compromise that. Um, the Northwest will always have my heart. I grew up here and my family's still here. Um, but equally, London completely captured me and I, I am eager to get back to Kensington as well at some point. Um, but for now, I think I've firmly planted some, at least um, for the foreseeable future type routes in the Northwest. So I do intend to be here for some time and eventually and just kind of work on this e-commerce business, mm. have a wider base, share those memories with people, share those flavors with people, and just get everything out there so that people can have those little bits of sweet happiness, really. <laughs> <laughs> What's the book called? So the book is called It Smells Like Curry, which is a bit of a comical name. And it's a nod to me walking through the alleys of Bolton 
um, when I was a kid and being able to smell auntie down the road making curry here and auntie down the road making this curry just from the smell and we'd say to one another and you'll a lot of uh, kind of British Asians may get the joke that we'll say to one another oh my god it smells like curry so for me that's where the name comes from and that's the nod to the heritage there and where I've grown up from as well so you know I, I a, a dear friend of mine is a guy called Enam Ali and Enam Ali is um runs a curry awards Oh, which I'm a okay. judge uh, of the Curry Awards, and I've been a judge for about 10 years, and, uh, or the British Curry Awards, as he calls it. And, and I love the fact that the, the British curry is now being served in Delhi and Bombay or Mumbai, you know, yeah. and, um, and, it, and a westernized curry has gone back. You know, and you can have your West, which I find, you know, fascinating the way uh, a traditional dish comes here. You know, we're great at, um, at developing. Uh, the you know, UK is, is probably now registered as the hospitality destination of the world. Certainly London is the food capital of the world. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I'll just finish on, but pick up on, which is really interesting what you said. So I run Young Chef, Young Waiter, and we're doing a global one. And I spoke to um, uh, India yesterday uh, from uh, from actually Mumbai, which is Bombay, isn't it? It's yes. the same, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And um, and the 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 thought now of promoting hospitality, serving service and cooking in India is really on. The, it's sort of gone like that, and now we're coming back because the chefs are starting to develop and Absolutely. obviously India has amazing food, amazing, you know, spices and everything, but it's starting to come back now. So what we're saying and what they love is it's the perfect time to say that if you're a waiter or a chef, you are a young professional, you are a professional person, you are a professional, you are a professional Absolutely. baker, of course you are. Yeah. It takes, you know, I'm a professional chef. It takes years to do what, what you and I do. But the person serving in that restaurant is a young professional or a professional Absolutely. doing his job because you will ask him and you can't just walk into any restaurant these days and just suddenly, okay, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll take you to the table because people won't accept it anymore because it's gone Absolutely. way past that. But as a young South Asian chap, you would have had that same men, um, that same sort of mentality from your parents saying, well, no, 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 you cannot be a waiter or, a, or you cannot be a chef. You cannot, because, you know, you went and studied law. You did exactly what your parents wanted. You came out with flying colors and then you said, actually, I'm going to go do some baking. So, <laughs> but, but I suppose you did tick all the boxes. But of course, we have that issue here now. Yeah. One, we have a big issue because, of course, we have the Brexit scenario because lots and lots and lots of, of, of term Indian restaurants, curry houses, uh, cannot get staff because they yeah. don't tick the right boxes because you have to be certain standard. But, of course, what you can't get is waiting staff. Well, you're not going to get, you know, British waiting staff. You will get, of course you will, but you're not going to get many going yeah. into a traditional curry house. So it's a real problem that we have. So the more we can do this end to promote uh, young chefs and waiters as young professionals in all, in all cultures, in all countries, in all communities, it's I really, really very, important. That's very true. When I look at the concept of young chef, young waiter, I mean, when I was sort of 18, 20, if I had seen an opportunity like that, I would have sort of snapped it up because mm. for, um, if MasterChef had never come along in my life, um, it would have been hard going, kind of getting that credibility as a South Asian um, wanting to be a chef or wanting to be a pastry chef or be a baker. Um, mm. Without that at all, um, it kind of needed to be there. Mm. And for me, ha getting that across to family was incredibly difficult. Um, and if you do want to go into this field and you do want to kind of make a career for yourself and can make it commercially viable, it takes a lot of effort. And these are the things that kind of 
South Asian mentality sometimes in the diaspora, mm -hmm. they're unable to see and that requires a great deal of effort and conviction and it's it's to be admired so if there's yeah, I agree. Any, yeah, yeah. yeah if there's any south asian sort of in this sort of position where they want to go into this field and they're worried about those aspects of the reactions of their parents and whether it's the correct way to do things whether it's not or whether it's too different i'd 100 percent be advocating the fact that you need to follow your passions maybe um you know, I, I did the whole law thing. Yes, I did tick the boxes, but maybe if I didn't and I went to Le Cordon Blur or um, um, some a, a catering college and I learned that way, maybe things would have been slightly different. I mean, you're not to know, and I'm very happy in the position that I am, but yeah, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. think that there needs to be the correct level of credibility given to this industry, especially within the mentality of the South Asian diaspora like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. Look, I hope, anyone looking has seen uh, and then somebody's a big fan from India somebody calling you <laughs> from India which is fantastic um, look it's been an absolute pleasure Dinesh to speak to you thank you for coming thank on my so restaurant much. live and I wish you all the luck and all the good fortune of the future you, you're 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 an incredible guy you're an incredible chef you're an incredible thank baker you. Uh, I can't wait to taste something one day. I'm sure it will happen one day. Certainly Absolutely. looking at your, um, your Instagram page, there are some um, fantastic dishes. I was looking at your um, coconut and, and whatever it was, cream buns. Oh my God, they look so <laughs> gorgeous. Let me quickly, I just quickly, I was on it. Oh, I've lost it now. Oh, it doesn't matter. I won't do it now. It's rude. But um, anyway, I was looking at your, all of your puddings and desserts. <laughs> and look, pleasure to see you. Uh, Thank you again. so, so much. And, um, and, you know, wish you continued success. And it's when been a great honor. Out... Thank you so much. I, you, you really made my day today. Thank you so much. For oh, it. it's very kind. Thank you. Well, when the book comes out, give us a shout. Let's promote it. And definitely, good luck definitely. to it. And let's taste some of those fantastic desserts. Can't absolutely, wait. Absolutely, absolutely. All sure. right. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Take bye, care. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye.